If there's one wine-producing region in the world which is the envy of the world, it's here, Bordeaux, home to such famous names as Chateau de Fite, Mouton Rothschild, saint emile and, of course, Chateau La Tour. A bottle of wine from here was recently sold to a London restaurant for £30,000. That's a lot of money. I suggest we should try it. But, you know, budgets are a bit tight these days. This week we'll discover the mysteries of blending and the magic of oat barrels. But the good news is we'll be tasting two excellent wines, Medoc and Sauterne. I hope you've got yours. Bordeaux lies on the west coast of France between the Atlantic and the River Dordogne. This is a region rich in history, fought over many times throughout the Middle Ages. It was ruled by the English for 300 years, following Henry II's marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine. And it was during this period that the local wine merchants took advantage of a good trading relationship with Britain and shipped over vast quantities of red Bordeaux. These wines soon took on the general name claret from the French claret, meaning pale red. So simply, claret means a red wine from Bordeaux, although it doesn't indicate the quality of the wine. But don't worry, we're not drinking Planck today, we're drinking an excellent Madoc. But before we can drink it, JP, our master of wine, Jonathan Pedley, is going to decant it for me. Yes, this is my sort of... Um, it's your big moment. My big moment. Uh, I failed as a butler, so um, here we go. There are two main things you're looking for or you're trying to do when you're decanting a wine. The first thing is some very full-bodied red wines will tend to have sediment in the bottle. So decanting is a fairly easy way of hopefully pouring off the clear wine and leaving the the dregs, the sediment in the bottom. The amount of wines you'll come across with the sediment will be fairly small. The candle, by the way, I bought just to show the point that if you've got a very sort of dark bottle, it will, if you put the candle actually underneath the neck, would be like so, yeah. exactly, you can then spot any sediment as it starts to come through. The other thing about decanting is that, of course, as the wine runs into the decanter, it's mixing with the air all the time, so you're getting some aeration. And as you know, this idea of letting red wine breathe before drinking it, in a way, decanting is a way of speeding that process up. So it's not as uh, archaic and bizarre as people might think, you know. I must apologize, by the way, for not telling you we were using decanters this week, but I've been pretty busy, you know. <laughs> so in fact, there is a bit of sediment here. Um, Whack it into a glass yeah. and... So you can see just there, against the white surface, you've got a bit of bit of sediment there. This will just be a bit of colouring matter, a bit of tannin, perhaps a bit of tartrate crystals, all completely harmless, but it's nice to get rid of them. So there we are. My God. Excellent. So why is Madoc so good? Well, you're probably aware, you know, by this stage in our travels that it's going to be a combination of factors that are going to give us the great quality here. First thing, the climate is very, very mild. Behind where the camera crew are, is a huge estuary called the Gironde. And further over, about 20 miles over there, is the Atlantic Ocean. So the Medoc is like a huge tongue of land separating these large expanse of water, so it's fantastically mild here. And of course, as you know with me, you're gonna get some nonsense about the soil, so they have a very special gravel soil. It's lovely gravel, I've, <laughs> I've inspected it. I found him this morning, just after breakfast, rummaging through the gravel, as usual. So it's those sort of things. Um, now, on the appearance, this is a 93, and 93 wasn't the greatest year in Bordeaux. Why but... are we drinking it then? <laughs> this is outrageous. Get something more expensive at once. <laughs> no, the reason for showing you the 93 was, first of all, I wanted to show you wine which did have a bit of sediment in the, in the bottle. Um, but secondly, because it wasn't a brilliant year, it's fairly well developed already in terms of its maturation. So what we can see is, as well as the fairly deep colour, is on the rim there, you can see the wine has lost its baby pink colour, it's mm -hmm. purple, it's moving more towards a sort of uh, ruby or a garnet colour, so it's not old looking yet, but it's it's showing the first sign of some age there. Now, on the smell... Doing twirling? I suppose in many ways you could say this is the most expensive smell in the world, and you've got quite a strong intense aroma, and the first thing maybe to look out for is this very distinctive black fruit character, and particularly black currant is, is something that's a recurrent theme in, in the Medoc, and then there's 
what the locals would say is the terroir character coming through, which is this uh, element that people describe as a cigar box or smell of cold tea or something. Sounds absolutely cold tea, eighty quid a bottle. <laughs> Sounds revolting, doesn't it? But it's one of those terribly, terribly difficult things to describe. But as I say, is very much the defining feature of the wine. It, to me, it, it it feels like lovingly and regularly polished antique furniture. Something comfortable about it. Yeah, there is that that side to it. it. It's one of those almost indefinable things which is the Medoc and is not really anywhere else in the world. So uh, that's the smell. And then on the taste, the wine is dry, obviously. A reasonable amount of acidity, a moderate amount of alcohol, and then a very, very important part of a classic Medoc is this structure of tannin. Which and this has quite a lot of. Yes, I mean, if you slurp a good Medoc around your mouth, you will always get, or should get, that astringent, almost sort of chewy character that you get on the taste. And all great Medoc wines should have that grip of the tannin. The grip of the tannin. Grip of the tannin. Gad. <laughs> Gad. Gripped by tannin in Medoc. But I mean, that does two crucial things. First of all, it's, it's part of the flavour structure. It's also obviously what's going to give the wine the capacity to age. A combination of richness of fruit and tannic structure is really what gives the longevity to a, any sort of classic red wine, but particularly a Bordeaux. I happen to know that this is made from 50% Cabernet Sauvignon and 50% Merlot. Now, that blending is an absolute science. So to create the Medoc we're drinking, the winemaker will select batches of Merlot he thinks will blend best with the Cabernet Sauvignon. The precise quantities of each are crucial, and even the most experienced winemaker will have to try every combination to get the right fit. Of course, another vital ingredient in the subtle flavours of Bordeaux wine is the oak. And wine growers take as much trouble selecting their barrels as they do blending their wines. It's important where the oak comes from. Different oaks give different flavours. The newer the wood, the stronger the flavour. And then, of course, the barrels are made to specific instructions. Some producers prefer a greater degree of burning, or toasting, as they call it. But barrels are expensive, cost around about £300 each, and are often used for only three years, which can add about a pound to a bottle for the cost of some wines. But producing the right barrels is an art, and the winemakers think it's worth every penny. JP, I rather enjoy wines that have been matured in oak, but how long do they keep the stuff in it? Well, here at Chateau Carbonio, which is one of the top estates in Bordeaux, they mature their red wine, you can see here, for about um, 18 months in cask, and one third of those barrels are new, so you get a fair amount of oak flavour that way. The white wine being a bit more delicate, and this is a general principle, doesn't mature for quite so long, more like about 10 months. But of course, the winemaker has to figure out, almost barrel by barrel, what the right amount of maturation is. I mean, particularly some of the Australian wines are completely over oaked in my view. It, it is a big risk, and I think that's partly because they like that very intense oak flavour. But, as I say, I think part of the skill is to monitor the wine by tasting from the barrel regularly to make sure the wine hasn't been over oaked at any stage. Step aside, JP. It sounds like a job for an expert. I think I'll have a go myself. <laughs> Although that particular barrel may have been jolly good, I think I can go one better. So I've decided to drop in on one of my favourite Chateau, just to check they're keeping up to scratch. In fact, I've managed to get us invited to Chateau Lafitte, home of probably some of the world's most prestigious wine. This, JP, is the best way to start a day. <laughs> in 11 o'clock on a sunny morning, in the most prestigious and most famous Chateau in the whole of France. We're sitting yeah. in the Chateau of Baron de Rothschild, Chateau of the Feet, and we've got a bottle of 83 to taste, haven't we? That's right, that's right. And this one I shall not delay opening. So, um... This is going to make my whole holiday, this is. I mean, my we... whole working trip. <laughs> what we're tasting here is obviously one of the world's great, great wines. Why is it so great? Well, it's got an incredible track record. It's a very, very complicated story, but essentially the top chateau in the, the Medoc, in this area of Bordeaux, have been around for donkey's years. You go back several hundred years and already the wines from this estate were very, very famous. Back in 1855, there was a league table drawn up of the top chateau 
in Bordeaux and Lafitte and some of the other top estates came in at the Premier Cru Class A, which is essentially the top division. 150 years later, it's still reckoned to be the business, you know, so we're tasting the best in the world, in effect. And, I mean, when you look at a wine like this, it's the 1983 vintage, so it's got some age to it. Yes. Um, and then, of course, what's going to make all the difference? Well, I mean, what can you say? Well, it just <laughs> smells so expensive. <laughs> that is just class. Very concentrated smell. It's, um, as I say, it's just complex and um, sensational. And then on the taste, I mean, this is 15 year, years old, and it's still got that dry, almost burly structure to it. Um, so although we're drinking it now, I think it's probably still got enough structure and concentration to last maybe another five, even 10 years. Well, I'm off to see the Baron and the Baroness. They're in residence at the moment. So um, by the time this bottle is empty, I'll be back. <laughs> The village of Saint-Emilion is famous for fine wine and fine food. And one of the classic dishes here are ribs of beef cooked in a rich red wine sauce thickened with beef marrow, which you can't buy in Britain, but you can buy very easily here. Anyway, let's get on with the sauce. Put some olive oil into my pot, just a little. Then some butter. Then immediately some very finely chopped shallots and brown those. Now, while those are just browning down, we turn our attention to the omelette. So, a little omelette of seps, you know, wonderful wild mushrooms, and some butter. And again, just a few finely chopped shallots. And a few coarsely chopped seps. Now, because it's the time of the year that I'm actually filming this, which is in August, I've had to use dried seps, but in September and October, whether you live in England, the United States, or France, or Spain, or Italy, you can get fresh ones, which, of course, are better. Right, now, we return to this. This is all looking good, so we add a little bit of flour into that. This is the old-fashioned way of cooking. All of the dishes I've been doing in this series are the old-fashioned ways, the classic regional dishes of France. Then, into that, we add a drop of beef stock. Now, I boiled up some bones with some carrots, leeks, onions, and this is the resulting liquid. Then we add about half a litre of the absolutely fabulous red wine of the region. Excellent medoc and we'll leave that to simmer away for a while. Right, and now the omelette. The seps and the onions are beautifully cooked. Now, down here, I've got some beaten eggs here. Put the eggs into that. Then we add a little fresh cream, like so. And then, the reason these are all hidden down on the floor is because it's so hot, it's virtually impossible to keep anything alive here at the moment. Everything's melting. Fold in some whites into that. A little more fresh cream onto that. A little bit of parsley. OK, we'll leave that for a second or two now while that cooks and see how our sauce is getting on over here. That's good. That needs to simmer for about half an hour or so, so I'll put it over the, the barbecue. Right, the omelette, hopefully, is about ready. Always nerve-wracking doing the simplest of things like an omelette because they can so easily go horribly wrong. But that one hasn't. Ah, saint -Emilion. If ever there was a moment that I'm really looking forward to a glass of something, it is this moment now. This rather grand stuff. Sorry, Mike, I'm over here now. We can whack on these wonderful ribs of beef on the bone onto the barbecue. Right, I want to bring this Bordelais sauce back onto here to finish, to finish that off. 
And you finish that off quite simply. You whisk in a bit of butter. This thickens it and makes it really unctuous. And then finally, this wonderful stuff, the cooked marrow, is allowed just to melt into that sauce. While they're cooking happily away, we come back and get the steaks. All the juices on the steak pour back into there. It's a useful tip. One. So we'll leave that one there for the second or two. And three of those. And then this most magnificent of sauces, sauce bordelaise, made with Santamillo or Medoc, or any good wine that you can get your hands on, goes over the whole lot. And there you have, in my interpretation at least, a typical snack that you might find at one of these chateaus if you could afford it. If you've managed to eat your way through that little feast, you probably wouldn't have room for a pudding, but especially for those of you with a sweet tooth, we're now heading to the southern part of Bordeaux for a really special wine, a Sauterne. Ah, a treat, JP, a treat. Yes, I'm, I'm a great fan of a good, a good sweet wine as well, so... I love this stuff. Without further ado. Excellent. My idea of heaven would be a block of foie gras and a bottle of this to start with, and then a raspberry meringue gatto and another bottle of this to finish with. Forget the bit in the middle. I was going to say, we can <laughs> cut the rest of it. Why is Sauterne so very special? It's supremely concentrated wine. Very, very rich, very full. One thing we can talk about is just how different and how much better great sweet wine is compared to the normal stuff. And Sauterne, of course, is uh, one of the most famous. Of course, the other good thing, these can be outrageously expensive, can't they? If you go oh, yeah, buying I mean... vintage... Uh, Chateau Yquem and others. That's right. I mean, you can pay as much for a fancy Sauterne or a fancy Barsac as you can for any other, you know, top start of wine. Now, um, the first thing when you're tasting Sauterne always to look out for is this fantastic colour. Yeah, you know, it's liquid gold, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's just a fantastic colour. Mm. And hopefully everyone who's tasting a Sauterne will be seeing this sort of appearance. And by the way, remember that Sauterne or Barsac, they're villages next to each other, so... Uh, you'll get the same lovely sort of depth of colour. Very, very bright. Now, on the smell, the thing that should always strike you about Sauterne is just this fantastic concentration and intensity of smell. Oh, apricots and grapefruit and honey. That's right. You've got huge amounts of white fruit character, as you say, overlaid with that lovely sort of honeyed, almost raisininess. Oh, it's really yummy, this stuff. I hope you're enjoying yours. And people also sometimes talk about a really good Sauterne, having almost to smell a bit like sort of lime marmalade or something like that. And yes, lime marmalade. Yes, I think it's very much like lime marmalade. <laughs> anyway, so that's our aroma. And then on the taste... That is mega sweet. Isn't it? it tastes very expensive. <laughs> Quite really like it. rich and opulent. Um, but a great Sauterne, as well as having all the sweetness, will also have very high levels of acidity. And probably people who are watching are tasting their wine thinking, well, what's he talking about? This just tastes sweet. But actually, underneath all that sweetness, there is actually a very refreshing acidity. Oh, indeed. So when indeed. you fill your mouth after you've tasted that, you find the cloying sweetness has gone. And the acidity there cleans up the sweetness of the flavour. So a great Sauterne is all about balance, a balance of the sweetness and of the acidity. I was doing some research in the bar of my hotel last night. They gave me these little cards. <laughs> and um, it says that one of these particular Sauterne is so good that the vine only yields enough grapes for one glass. Yeah. Does that apply to all Sauternes? Yeah, it's sent, I mean, at the top level, yeah. The yield levels in Sauterne are very, very low. But the result, as you and I have tasted, is this huge concentration. Um, this is almost like a normal wine, but concentrated six times over. Oh, no, that's it's incredible. delicious. Another thing that we should obviously, I think, touch on is the, con the relationship between Sauternes and food. People have this, I think, rather narrow view of sweet wine. As just for being for pudding, which yeah. of course is absolutely not true. Um, they go well with foie gras, for example, and indeed some chefs even make a jelly of Sauternes to set their goose livers in, which is very delicious. They go well with all kinds of 
uh, cheeses, particularly the salty cheeses like Roquefort and goat's cheeses in general, although Roquefort is, of course, a sheep's cheese. Um, I like it with smoked fish, not smoked salmon, but things like smoked herrings and smoked eel, that kind of stuff. Cold chicken and salad. I think it's nice. Any kind of white cold meat, I think it's very pleasant with. I think that's the message we need to get. This is a much more versatile wine than just a pudding wine, yeah, you know. Absolutely. I mean, that, I think it's a shame. In fact, it's so good. <laughs> you ought to try a drop more. The trouble is with this, because it's so expensive, I mean, most of us can only afford it every now and again, and it's just in a half bottle. Yes. But today, we're, we're not pushing paying, the so it doesn't matter. So here's the Sauterne. Here's the Sauterne. This is excellent. Bring on the creme brulee, please. <laughs> that was really good, don't you think? Although, I bet a few of you never thought you'd enjoy a sweet wine. Apparently, or at least according to JP, you can't make a sweet wine just by chucking in a bucket of sugar. So we're off to the village of Sauterne to find out how it's done. Now, the way they actually make this stuff is actually rather magical, you know. Um, here we are in August, and you can see a nice sort of bunch of grapes just ripening quite well. Now, if we came back in September, that bunch would be fully ripe, lovely and golden. Now, if it was a normal white wine, we'd pick the grapes at that stage. Mm -hmm. But the magic thing here in Sauterne is they then leave those bunches actually on the vine. They don't pick them. And what they're praying for is this slightly sort of warm, uh, muggy, humid weather. Actually, a bit like it is Today, this morning, fact, slightly yes. sort of sticky. And that triggers this extraordinary process called noble rot. And what happens is the mould makes tiny holes in the skin of the grape and the water in the grape gradually evaporates. So you can imagine something that starts like a normal grape slowly shrivels up and after a period of several weeks you end up with uh, like a little shriveled up brown raisin. And then the pickers have to go through the vineyard and actually pick these grapes one at a time. They press those raisins and of course because this has shriveled right down it's incredibly rich in sugar. So the juice that comes out is almost like honey. The yeast can't ferment all the sugar and you end up with a glorious sweet wine. So that's, that's a lovely do. story. But you know, when those autumnal mists come in, that's also the sprat season for those fish lovers. Oh, right. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> well, they do say there's a wine for every occasion, and the region of Bordeaux produces a huge quantity of it. In fact, more wine than California. But it's not just quantity here, nor quality. Bordeaux produces a vast variety of different wines, like Entre de Mer, Grave, Bourges, Pessac Lignon, as well as saint I had with lunch, and the Medocs and the Sauternes we tasted. The wines of Bordeaux are respected around the world.